As I was flipping through a book about historic palaces in Paris, especially those that are rarely accessible to the public, a rather unusual story sparked my interest. The fascinating story I'm about to describe relates the life of Blanche de Paiva, the woman behind Hôtel de la Paiva, one of the most emblematic monuments on the Champs-Élysées. Hôtel de la Paiva was built over a decade, from 1856, and is now the sole surviving example of the magnificent palaces that once lined this iconic avenue. Blanche de Paiva was a captivating figure who left a lasting legacy in Paris. She was one of the most admired, yet at the same time despised courtesans of 19th century France and was renowned for her charm, wit and beauty. Additionally, Blanche had a keen business sense and was determined to make a name for herself in a male-dominated world. With different names, multiple lovers, three marriages and a willful ambition, Blanche was committed to rising above extreme poverty and transforming her social status. She was determined to ascend the ranks of Parisian high society and even outshine the elite by building a true architectural masterpiece. In her own words, the best hôtel particulier in Paris. It is believed, not surprisingly given her character, that she built Hôtel de la Paiva on the very spot where she had suffered humiliation in her youth. Without this palace, her name and story would be barely remembered. The life of a courtesan can be either romanticized or vilified. Some depict it as glamorous and luxurious, while others regard courtesans as scheming women who go to any length to achieve their objectives. However, as we all know, life is never black or white. Being a courtesan was a double-edged sword. They were considered the grandest and most elite of prostitutes, enjoying a status that allowed them to afford expensive jewellery and residences throughout the country. They received protection from wealthy and powerful men who prevented police intervention. However, despite their extravagant wealth, courtesans were still there for the purpose of male dominance. They were merely seen as status symbols and maintaining a courtesan provided the same prestige as owning a private mansion or a beautiful carriage. They were not entirely immune to adversity as their financial security was closely tied to the men who supported them. While some biographers may depict Blanche as an overly ambitious social climber who was excessive in her desire for material possessions and unrefined in her extravagant display of wealth, I prefer to explore the motivation that may have driven her and other women of her time to exhibit such behavior as well as what fueled her relentless ambition. Let's put this story in a social context to better understand the life choices Blanche had to make in that era. In her book La Femme Pauvre, published in 1866, the author Julie Daubier, the first woman to obtain a high school degree in France, described the hardship faced by female workers in the 19th century. The female worker has no choice other than to sell her body, even in times of industrial prosperity, because of the insufficient salary she received. Women as vulnerable second-class members of society at the time had few to no prospects to make it in the world. An article about women's living and working conditions in 1871 confirms just that. The favored image of women that pervaded the culture of Second Empire of France stressed women's passivity and quiet suffering in the face of adversity, the alleged source of her moral strength. This docile, saintly, revered creature was mirrored by her rival sister, the coquette, a guileful seductress who nonetheless remained dependent on men for her survival. Even social thinkers of the time limited women's role in society, housewife or prostitute. Let's go back to Blanche's story. Blanche was born Esther Lachman to Polish parents in the Jewish ghetto of Moscow in 1819. The Jewish ghetto was a segregated area where Jews were forced to live due to the unfair policies of the Russian Empire. The living conditions in the ghetto were extremely harsh, with overcrowding, poor sanitation and a lack of basic amenities. At the age of 17, she married a modest French tailor with whom she had a son. However, she soon became dissatisfied with her mediocre and restrictive life in poverty and fled to Paris in 1839, at the age of 20. After arriving in Paris, Esther reinvented herself as Thérèse and began working as a prostitute. She worked in a low-priced brothel where the lives of poor prostitutes were marked by humiliation, abuse and constant persecution by the police and authorities. One can only imagine the hardships that Thérèse endured before devising a plan to lift herself out of misery and the constant threat hanging over her head. 
It is said that her comprehension of social structure was straightforward. Wealth was the only path to survival, independence and domination. So becoming a courtesan and pursuing wealthy men appeared to be the sole viable choice. As part of her strategy, Therese started investing in the latest dresses and fashionable accessories, which she bought on credit, in order to meet rich men in places such as concerts and theatres. Her plan started to come to fruition, and at the age of 22, she met the successful pianist Henri Hertz, who was 38 years old at the time. While attending one of his concerts, they became a couple. Hertz introduced her as his wife, and Therese, who by this time had a new name Blanche, called herself Mrs. Hertz as if she wanted to establish status and respect. I find the choice of the name Blanche quite interesting. It's possible that she chose this name to assimilate into French society, adhering to their culture and norms. Was she attempting to distance herself from her past by embracing a name that means freshness, purity and new beginnings? The name Blanche could have aided her in attaining a higher social standing as it was linked to nobility and elegance. Thanks to her relationship with Ertz, she became in contact with influential figureheads, musicians and authors. In 1848, Ertz went bankrupt, Blanche was rejected by his family and she was again penniless. She then travelled to London where she managed to maintain a certain lifestyle thanks to her several affairs with rich lords. After a few years, she came back to Paris and married Albino Francisco de Paiva, an heir to vast wealth based in part on the opium trade. Though he was sometimes called the Marquis, Albino was not an aristocrat and had no title, being the son of commoners. Blanche obtained the title of Marquise de Paiva, which provided her with another opportunity to ascend the social ladder. Unfortunately, the wedding was short-lived, and the couple parted ways after just two years. The annulment of their marriage was only finalized in 1871, and the Marquis, who was burdened with debt, tragically took his own life the following year, in 1872. Prior to that, in 1852, she met Count Guido Henkel von Donnersmark, a Prussian 11 years her junior. Guido and Blanche were married in 1871, and Blanche de Paiva became a countess at last. With Guido's assistance, she began work on her celebrated and luxurious mansion, which she named after herself. Blanche's ambition led her to conceive an audacious plan, to build a grand hôtel particulier on the Champs-Élysées. She enlisted the help of a talented architect and oversaw every aspect of the construction process, from the selection of the finest materials to the placement of the tiniest details. It is believed that Blanche de Paiva was culturally knowledgeable and had significant talents. She spoke multiple languages, played the piano, enjoyed opera, was an avid reader, and skillfully mastered the business world. She was perfectly capable of engaging in intelligent conversations with distinguished and intellectual guests. At her dinner parties, she hosted prominent figures such as the French novelist Gustave Flaubert, Théophile Gautier, and Alexandre Dumas. However, Blanche's many accomplishments did not shield her from prejudice and discrimination, as she faced opposition from certain members of the Parisian elite who were unwilling to accept her as an equal. Despite her status as a successful businesswoman and patron of the arts, Blanche was the subject of gossip and scandal and was often stigmatized in a hypocritical way as unvirtuous and lacking in morals. Adding to her troubles, she was harshly criticized behind her back by the very people, mostly men, who attended her lavish parties. They often made comments on her physical appearance, describing her as old, unattractive and overly made up. Unfortunately, her life in Paris came to an end when war broke out with Prussia. Society began to view Blanche with suspicion. Her husband, being Prussian and closely tied to high spheres of power, was quickly accused of being a spy on the payroll of the enemy. Blanche and her husband were forced into exile in Silesia. She suffered greatly from this forced removal and social degradation. The dream was over and the strategy had been played out. She died in exile in 1884 at the age of 65. Now, let's examine what distinguishes Hotel de la Paiva as an impressive example of private architecture and interior design during the French Second Empire. 
The luxurious mansion is nothing short of stunning. The design created and brought to life by the architect Pierre Manga placed women painted or sculpted at the center of the design theme. Female representations can be found throughout the property, with Blanche's likeness serving as a primary source of inspiration. The magnificent staircase is undeniably the showpiece of the property. It is almost entirely made of Algerian onyx, which is a type of marble. Blanche is represented naked and covered with jewels riding a dolphin. The main reception room with five tall windows overlooking the avenue of the Champs-Élysées has kept its magnificent wall decoration and an imposing fireplace made of red and white marble. The dining room overlooking the patio and the greenhouse is decorated with the most spectacular fireplace in the mansion, with marble columns, sculptures of lionesses and a flying eagle. The music room is decorated with a fresco painted by Henri Picou. The gilded bronze mantle is decorated with a woman's head, probably that of the hostess, and two statues of lionesses. In the bedroom a sizable bed can be found, but the most fascinating part of Blanche's private quarters is the bathroom, designed and decorated in the Moorish style. Algerian onyx with bright blue ties create a very oriental atmosphere. The presence of three gigantic mirrors prove that Blanche was comfortable with her body. Finally, an exceptional silver-plated bronze bath, shaped by the Christopher factory, built in an onyx casing, can be found. Okay, I hope you enjoyed listening to Blanche's story. Uh, if you'd like to read the written post, which is one of my most popular posts actually on my blog, you can check the link on the description below. So thank you for listening and until the next time.